Well, thank you all for joining us for another Nickel at Noon. It's just um, a real delight to see so many familiar faces and so many new faces. So uh, welcome everybody. Um, I'd like to begin today by acknowledging the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, Pikani, and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, which includes the Chiniki, Bearspaw, and Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Um, again, welcome. This is Nicolette Noon, the online edition. Uh, we've been live uh, and online since the middle of September, and we've got a few more events uh, coming up. Uh, our last one before Christmas is December the 10th, and then we will pick up the program again probably the second week in January. So just watch uh, your social media outlets for, um, for the upcoming program. We bring you lively discussions about art and culture here and now. The program is free and to register you can either connect with Marla or myself or uh, register through Eventbrite. Uh, the full program details are posted on our website as well as postings to Facebook, Instagram, Twitter and YouTube. And if you like, you can subscribe to our email list and we'll deliver our program information right into your inbox so you don't have to look for it. Uh, we will ask um, for you to keep your microphones on mute if you wouldn't mind during the presentation. Uh, we'll hold the questions until the end of Diana's talk and then we really want to hear your voices and uh, would welcome your, your questions. If you have something burning, you're very welcome to use the chat function and uh, Marla or myself will, uh, you know, maybe interrupt Diana with, with a burning question if there is one. Also just warn you that uh, we do um, uh, record these presentations and the past presentations have been loaded to YouTube. So you are welcome to visit that channel and uh, subscribe and uh, watch or re-watch any of the presentations so far. Um, I'm about a week behind. Mary Beth's wonderful presentation from last week should go up today or tomorrow. Just be, uh, just be warned that if you talk during the presentation, uh, your voice will be recorded and uh, it's not something that I can edit out. However, your name and the chat function won't be in the final recording. So uh, um, that is thanks to Zoom. Some introductions. My name is Michelle Hardy. I'm one of the two curators with Nickel Galleries and your host today. Marla Halstead is our front end manager and uh, working, working the scenes behind Zoom. Thank you, Marla. Next week, we are inviting uh, Helen um, Hajnitschke uh, to do an artist talk. Uh, Helen is a really interesting local artist, poet, graphic artist, weaver, storyteller. She's a fascinating um, colleague here at the, uh, at, at the university and uh, we're thrilled to invite her next week. But the main event today is Diana Sherlock, who will be talking about Mary Shannon Will, People, Places and Things. Diana Sherlock is one of the most, in my humble opinion, one of the most exciting contemporary art writers, thinkers, educators and independent curators working in Western Canada today. In addition to teaching at AU Arts, Diana is a prolific writer and has published over 60 texts in gallery catalogs and contemporary art journals um, nationally and internationally. And in 2018, she edited a critical monograph on Canadian artist Rita McCo on her performances and installations, a publication that is still available through Truck Gallery if you're interested. Diana is a prolific independent curator with projects that have been shown across Western Canada and internationally. She's also curated a number of highly influential projects for Nickel Galleries. Um, and just a snippet of that, in 2009, of course, there was Folly, Chateau Mathieu, featuring the work of Gloria Mock, Laura Vickerson, Greg Pace, Hutch Hutchinson, and Walter May. In 2016, she curated for us New Maps of Paradise, featuring the work of Eric Moskopetis and Mia Rushton. 
and her most recent project, 2020's Mary Shannon Will, People, Places and Things, the first retrospective of this important multidisciplinary Calgary-based artist. The exhibition is beautiful, creative, insightful, and I know I'm teasing you all. Um, it's an insightful look at Shannon's work from her earliest ceramics through to her works on canvas and paper. Alas, it is not open to the public yet because of COVID, because of the university's rules, but we look forward to the day that we can invite you all into the gallery and share this really important and beautiful exhibition. She's an inspiring colleague and it's a very, it's a great pleasure to welcome Diana Sherlock. So um, thank you so much uh, for inviting me to talk today and uh, thank you Michelle for the uh, invitation and the introduction. Um, I just uh, want to start by again yeah, acknowledging I'm grateful to also be here on Treaty 7 uh, land and making territory three um, and to uh, grateful to all the people who I share this land with uh, that allow me to be here today. And um, I just want to thank, I want to start just by thanking the Nickel and um, Christine Soyak in particular, uh, but the whole team. Uh, it's a small team, but it's a wonderful team. And uh, the project um, with Mary Shannon Will, uh, you know, would never have come to fruition uh, in the way it has without the, the whole team's effort. And I'm just, uh, it's just been such a pleasure to work with you all uh, and uh, on the project and now to, to see it uh, all together is really, uh, yeah, it's really, really wonderful. Um, and I also want to thank Mary uh, to start with too uh, for sharing her work and her time with me over the last several years. Um, I think I proposed this exhibition to the Nickel in 20 was either late 2017, or early 2018. Um, and uh, Mary and I have known each other since the early 90s, but um, um, I really never had an opportunity to uh, delve into the, the breadth of her practice. Um, Mary's been producing work uh, in a very consistent, dedicated way uh, now since the, the late 60s. And um, for me, the, the whole process of working uh, on the show with Mary um, has just been is so rewarding and it's been such an eye opener to uh, the, the approaches in her practice and her, her interests uh, in uh, materiality and concepts and how those things have, have really um, recurred throughout a 50 or 60 year period uh, in various ways, but kind of looping back uh, on one another over and over again. So for me, it's been, it's been a real learning experience and a really pleasurable one uh, as well. Um, uh, I'm excited about this exhibition in particular because uh, Mary Shannon Well, People, Places and Things is, is uh, really the first exhibition Mary's had that is a significant uh, exhibition that shows a, a real range or scope of her work. Um, she's had uh, a number of other exhibitions, uh, particularly one curated um, um, uh, or organized by Joan Stebbins at the Southern Alberta Art Gallery in 1985, uh, for which there's a, a very nice catalog uh, that Victoria Bastard wrote wrote for. Uh, that was a very important uh, uh, exhibition um, in the mid 80s that really looked at uh, Mary's sort of transition from ceramics to uh, a two dimensional practice primarily at that time in printmaking and then moving into painting. Um, Subsequently, um, Mary's been included obviously in lots of group shows, uh, but significant bodies of work have been sort of repeated, repeatedly shown uh, at different stages since the, the uh, sort of early 1990s uh, at Paul Kuhn Gallery, her commercial uh, uh, gallery in Calgary. And, um, you know, those exhibitions too have been very important in the sense that they have given uh, sort of um, uh, an ongoing look uh, every two to three years at new bodies of work uh, that Mary uh, has been uh, completing along the way. 
Um, and they are primarily, those exhibitions are primary, are showing um, um, collections of work that are in series. So um, they're, they're somewhat contained, if you will, in terms of looking at a very uh, focused uh, part of the practice. So this exhibition uh, I'm really excited about because it's uh, the first time really we've been able to bring together a whole range of Mary's practice uh, work, the earliest work in the show uh, from 1968, which is student work, um, and all the way up to work in the present, present day. Um, I was also really excited about trying to do a show with Mary because I think the work, um, particularly the early ceramic work and uh, just the, the process-based um, approach to, to her practice in all media is, is very current. Um, so there are a lot of, um, I see a lot of younger artists, emerging artists uh, that are working in uh, clay and, um, uh, pencil, crayon, and um, uh, painting that are really interested in these ideas of, um, of mark making and systems and sort of rule based practices. Um, and so I'm, although it's very different, the context now is very different, uh, particularly for the ceramics than it was 40 years ago or 50 years ago, uh, I think there's a kind of um, uh, cyclical nature in the art world, in the art community, and I think it's pretty interesting when you can show the work of a senior artist who's been practicing for over 50 years uh, to a younger generation of artists who are starting out, um, and they're all in this community, but this may not be work that is familiar to them. So I'm really, will be very, very excited when uh, the show is able to open to the public. Obviously, uh, it is up but um, somewhat restricted currently due to COVID. Uh, but when it is able to open for some public access, I'm really, I really would like to go through uh, the show with uh, a couple of groups of uh, particular young emerging artists in the city and just sort of see what their responses are to the work and if what I think is actually, um, what I see in the work is actually uh, resonating with them. Um, also throughout the um, 1980s, I guess, uh, 80s and uh, into the 90s, um, there was a real interest in systems-based work, particularly generative technology, uh, computer-based um, systems uh, in contemporary art practice. And that's too something that Mary has explored in her practice that we'll talk about in a little bit later. Uh, so again, and it's another very, I think, contemporary discourse that uh, she has been working in or had worked in for a number of years previously. So unlike um, any other show I've ever done, and I, this show is organized chronologically, and um, it's, uh, it's organized chronologically, and then it has some uh, um, sort of material and formal or conceptual loops, if you will, uh, that uh, return the uh, newer work to earlier work. Um, so I'm interested in the idea of um, not only Mary's um, relationship to abstraction, which has been consistent throughout her practice, but also her relationship to conceptual practice and the way in which um, she still embraces aesthetics and um, um, her own subjectivity, both in abstract works uh, and uh, conceptually driven uh, practices as well. So we'll talk about a little bit, little bit of that as we go through the work here. So we'll just start. And um, so this is the earliest work in the show and I am gonna do, it's a little bit of a walking tour uh, if incomplete, uh, but just to get a sense of what the installation is like um, and how the works relate to one another in the space. Um, uh, I guess if I had had the opportunity in different circumstances, I would have done this as a, as a tour uh, and this is as close as we're gonna get to it now. Um, so this is the earliest work in the exhibition. It's uh, from 1968. And it's a bisflired clay uh, piece uh, that is covered in automotive paint. Um, it's quite small, 
many of the early ceramics um, are um, in the University of Lethbridge Art Collection, um, and they were really terrific to work with uh, to secure um, uh, many, many loans for the exhibition. So uh, thank you to the team there as well. Um, and I think uh, the context of this work is interesting. So Mary uh, was, uh, she's born in Samson, Samson New York, and, uh, but she was, uh, uh, grew up sort of all over the states. She moved all over the states. Her dad worked in the Navy and uh, was then an academic afterwards. And um, so she was quite mobile. So travel uh, in different places uh, that she has been uh, throughout her life have certainly informed the, her practice in the work. Um, she studied um, ceramics at the University of Iowa. She was uh, most interested in studying sculpture at the time, uh, but couldn't get in. Um, uh, the program. So uh, in 1964, she started working in, in ceramics in Iowa and then uh, worked through um, her program and uh, attended and taught at uh, Tuscarora, Nevada, uh, a few years later. So Mary grew out of a, a ceramics tradition that was very much based in um, functional uh, brown pot functional uh, wear, um, and she was very proficient in that, uh, but however, uh, became really much more interested in sculptural form and expression, um, expressionistic form uh, through the clay body um, than making exclusive uh, functional wear. There is one functional piece, one um, brown pot, quote unquote, uh, in the exhibition uh, in a case that I'll point out to you later. Um, so this work that you're seeing here from 1968 and the next work that we'll see in the slides is um, very, very colorful um, and um, pushes against or back, um, uh, if you will, against uh, sort of the, the brown pot um, um, type of uh, uh, pottery that was done, being done at the time. Uh, it is uh, not functional, it is sculptural. Uh, it is concerned with um, uh, sculptural form and the surface and the relationships between those things is also very concerned with, you know, um, these kind of biomorphic forms or um, biological forms that really draw from, say, either the human anatomy or they draw from, you know, plants uh, later on landscape to some degree. Uh, so they're, they are abstract, but they are also grounded in, uh, in these other types of experiences that Mary processes through um, the sculpting of the clay uh, and then uh, painting them. And they are painted, I would say, uh, with um, these very vibrant uh, uh, glazes, uh, um, very bright colors. So there's a, uh, again, the, the sort of gender dynamic as well. Uh, I think in, in the ceramics community at the time, very male dominated, uh, very driven towards, uh, again, functional wear, uh, brown pots, uh, um, a lot of the sculptures that were being produced at the time, say by, even by people like Peter Volkus, who were, was definitely an influence and had come through Iowa um, while Mary was there. Um, Peter Volkus, uh, ex expressionistic forms, but definitely with a, a kind of uh, a more of a machismo, if you will, uh, to them than what you're seeing here in Mary's um, um, sculptured forms. The surfaces, uh, the painted surfaces on these objects uh, are very, very intricate and complicated. They often combining colors that are uh, complicated to combine. Um, and this uh, work is, um, uh, uses airbrush technique as well to spray the glazes on. This is quite uh, common for Mary um, in the um, early, uh, years of her ceramics, so the 70s uh, into the 80s. Uh, another form here where there's a bit of a return, if you will, 
to the, the throw and vessel form. Uh, and then with these sort of mountainous uh, prongy protrusions that come out of the container. Uh, they, sometimes I think some of the, the formal imagery of Mary's uh, work, it, it could be considered uh, you know, sort of sexual or rude or, uh, you know, it's a little, it's quite playful, quite irreverent um, and, uh, you know, sort of counters the sort of stoicism of say, um, you know, a, a modern, modern uh, Raku uh, through Bernard Leach or even um, some of the um, more uh, contained sculptural works that were happening uh, at the time. This piece is a very important piece from 1978. It's in the AFA collection and it's important because it's one of the first times Mary really moves towards um, um, process or a system-based approach to mark making um, on the surface of the vessel. Um, obviously, ceramics uh, is very process-oriented in and of itself. Uh, uh, it's very technical. Uh, you have to be very skilled, uh, uh, a very skilled technician to um, um, uh, make the forms, to deal with shrinkage, to put the elements together, uh, to um, have the underglaze and then the overglazes. Many of Mary's pots are fired many, many times. And this piece, uh, the black marks that you see in the surface of it um, are actually um, uh, residue from kneading in nylon fibers to the clay body and then when you fire the clay, those nylon fire, fibers fire out and they leave little lines and pock marks on the uh, surface of the, the bisqueware. Um, and Mary would go back in with ceramic pan, uh, pan and pencils and she would, she would follow them, she would trace them. Uh, and that would start to determine some of this, this surface pattern. Um, so at this point, there's this uh, element of chance of what the material is actually, um, what the material allows, but also what the material can can determine in terms of Mary's future future actions. Uh, this is done in 1978, um, and 78 was quite a prolific year for Mary with quite a few changes. Uh, and this piece uh, was done just before Mary went to Halifax. So when Mary went to Halifax, she was um, there in 1980. Uh, around 1980, and uh, at that time at NASCAD, you were sort of at the height of conceptualism. Um, there were a lot of um, artists coming through, people like Sala Witt, who were very um, uh, committed to conceptual art practice and rules and system-based approaches, uh, committed to, to the grid in his particular case as well. Um, and so um, I think all of those factors uh, were, were around Mary and influencing Mary. And while she was in Halifax, she was uh, drawing. And, um, and while she was drawing, she was starting to adopt rules of, of how the drawing would, would unfold, what materials she would use, in what order, what color she would pick, those types of things. If she would, if she would make a drawing with one eye open or one eye closed. Uh, so these kinds of parameters were starting to really percolate in the work. And, and, and they really did start here with this one, one piece of ceramics. Uh, Sala Witt was um, always, uh, is most famous for saying uh, that conceptual art is the idea, the idea becomes the machine that makes the art. Um, so this idea to really um, push away from um, uh, the subjective constraints on on art, uh, and to um, you know give it all over to the rule based process. Um, and while this is definitely evident in Mary's work, starting in seventy eight with the ceramics, and then moving into um, some drawings, and then the transition into two D works, um, it is not exactly, she does not ad ad adopt uh, that type of conceptual uh, process um, uh, completely. There's always room in these works, or Mary allows room in these works for subjectivity, for idiosyncratic uh, parameters and practice. Um, 
for chance, that is also, I would say, tempered um, by uh, intuition and intuition being something that is always, you know, comes from somewhere. Uh, it is informed by some things. So um, uh, Mary will tell you that she's always most interested in the end of it has to look good. She's concerned with the look of the final object, the aesthetic of the final object. The first uh, set of images that you saw were in a set of long cases as you uh, outside of the gallery proper. Here, the image you're looking at is inside gallery one. Um, and uh, this gallery um, contains a number of works that uh, range from uh, 1980. Um, actually, I believe 1979, um, all the way up till um, uh, 1990. And so this is, uh, this is an attempt to try to put some of the, uh, the later ceramic works, the more ge geometric ceramic works that you see there in the foreground, uh, together with um, some of the early uh, two-dimensional works, prints, drawings, paintings, uh, there's oil stick as well. Uh, so there's a variety of different uh, materials here. And what we're, what we're really looking at, um, or I'm trying to develop here, is a sense of kind of uh, this transition of the conceptual practice of uh, systems and rule-based um, ideas to a number of different uh, media over about a 20-year uh, period, 10-year uh, period, I guess. Uh, so this first grouping here, and these are these are installation shots, by the way, that were taken prior to the installation being 100% complete. So um, if you notice some aberrant objects on the floor or missing cases or things like that, that's why. Um, so this is so I could have them in advance so I would be able to do the presentation. Um, so this cluster of um, uh, ceramics and working drawings for the ceramics is uh, um, all of this work is from the early 80s and this is a pretty um, a productive uh, point in Mary's um, uh, mature ceramic um, uh, career. Um, these works are um, hand built and wheel thrown. They're made of white earthenware. Um, they are, in most cases, templates are not used. So the surface patterning is, um, is worked out um, uh, very carefully in advance on test tiles. And there are some of those in the exhibition later on. Um, and also worked out through the, um, the preparatory drawing that you see here. Um, so just as a close up, this uh, preparatory drawing um, would give um, uh, Mary a, a good sense of how she was going to approach and build the object. Uh, there's ways of thinking through the patterning, uh, the color uh, combinations in these works as well uh, through the preparatory drawings. And even this one called What is Your Favorite Color really points to the fact that here we're also starting to see in this work a shift from um, the uh, sculptural forms, more organic sculptural forms, to these geometric forms that are really focused on surface um, and how surfaces and uh, edges of color and uh, flat planes of color and patterns planes of color bump up against one another uh, and and change the way we read an object. They're, they're kind of, um, again, um, a bit tongue-in-cheek and funny too, I, I think, uh, in the sense that they're built on primary forms, um, the, the, you know, the idea of primary colors, uh, but they actually always use colors that are, are not primary. They're actually, they're much more uh, complicated combinations of colors uh, that you wouldn't normally find in geometric abstraction, for example. Um, they seem to uh, play with or um, usurp the stability of uh, geometric abstraction and the ideas of the stability, the grid, the primary uh, pure form. Um, so these, one of the challenges I think Mary set for herself in these works is certainly um, 
the forms themselves, how the forms and the surfaces uh, combine, and then also this sort of playfulness of color and how color itself becomes something that really starts to take over um, uh, her primary interests. When you're looking at sort of the edges of uh, where one plane meets up against another plane um, and you're looking at uh, these heavily patterned surfaces that are hand done as well. Um, it's a geometric form yet it is not. Um, uh, it's a, all, these are altered geometric forms that have been hand built, put together, and then painted with uh, uh, very difficult combinations of color, which for Mary, she believes there are no bad color combinations. Also very influential um, at this moment is this very small tile that's eight, uh, eight by seven inches. Um, uh, it's called, could this be a small stereotypish rug? Um, and it's um, from 1981. And it was a wedding present actually to uh, Giselle Amatea and Peter White. Uh, Peter worked um, uh, here at the Glenbow at the time and Giselle was an artist working uh, in uh, ceramics and other things as well at the time, uh, both based in Montreal now. Um, and this very small uh, painted tile uh, is uh, significant for a couple of reasons. One, the pattern is drawn from a hooked rug, uh, an actual object that Mary uh, found in uh, Cape Breton on a trip there. Um, and so that sort of gridded pattern is, is pulled from a, a hooked rug, which is obviously uh, an, a material culture object that is based in, um, um, based in life and based in use and based in utility. Um, and then uh, the colors that you see that are painted there are china paints and they were lifted from, they were each selected individually from a box of china paints that Mary had in her studio. Um, and whatever uh, china paint she lifted, she would use. So there's this element of chance again in terms of determining uh, what, um, what colors would be used and in which combination. So this is where we really start to see a shift to two-dimensional work and using that, that process um, uh, or procedural painting. Odeon Keepsake too is an important work in this regard, uh, work on paper. Uh, and um, this is an important work for a number of reasons. One, the, the uh, yellow rectangle in the middle is uh, an actual uh, ticket from the Odeon restaurant in Tribeca, New York City. And um, uh, Mary and John and others would go to uh, New York quite frequently and had been at this place. Uh, they had a leftover ticket and she used it um, as the sort of central feature um, uh, for this drawing. And so the, the ticket itself starts to determine obviously the, the shape um, uh, and reason uh, for laying down the um, uh, concentric circles of dots. The concentric circles of dots are determined the color again by a random selection of the um, uh, paint uh, from what she had available uh, at home. And this, uh, this is a work that she did at home on, uh, on her kitchen table um, and, um, uh, and at the time she was in Halifax. So uh, these are two very important transitional works. Mary, um, in 1984 to 86, she really more or less stops making ceramics and moves primarily to um, uh, two-dimensional painting. Um, these two early works, um, Untitled and Fallen Monument, um, are um, uh, too small. Again, I want you to note the sizes. The works are very petite scale, so 8 by 8, 10 by 10, 12 by 12 quite often. Um, these works are done on um, 
on a board uh, that has been prepped and sanded and um, I'll show you a detail in a minute but then layers and layers and layers of, of dots colored dots are built up uh, to make the shapes the shapes obviously are referring back to uh, or recall the the same forms that Mary was using in her ceramics so the ge geometric ceramics in particular um, there's movements in these works there's um, she was interested in, in at the time uh, in Russian constructivism uh, so you can see the influence of Russian constructivism in in the the way that the uh, shapes interact with one another on the plane uh, uh, picture plane um, Interestingly, the perspectives here are imagined, the planes don't really intersect that much. They, instead, they are flattened, they, they sit one on top of the other. Uh, so that kind of flatness that you see in the early geometric ceramics uh, and those uh, that interested in the way planes sort of bump up against one another is, is very present in these two works. Um, the, the, um, the shapes themselves, I always, sort of think of these are like they almost turn into characters if you will and they function in this very shallow shallow space this shallow imaginary space um, like a stage um, and it's interesting here too we start to move from a lot of the work being called untitled prior to this uh, to titled works which becomes um, ever more common as we move forward so this is a detail of a uh, fallen monument and the again a narrative title and um, this is just a detail of the surface and so this is the you can see all of the individual dots I hope building up uh, on the surface here and Mary would build up a surface of dots and she would sand back she would, uh, put over a layer of uh, medium sand back and then repeat so these are this is thousands and thousands of individual dots that almost sort of meld together uh, when you're looking at them they give you the sense almost like a glazed object uh, they meld together but they are distinct nonetheless um, so there's like a continuous skin or or glaze uh, in these two works as an installation shot, uh, just going around the corner, again, just in terms of what I was trying to do here and the importance of including some of the uh, later uh, ceramic works in this area is to go back and forth between these ideas of surface and form, um, how they were playing out in the ceramics and in the paintings and drawings at the time. Uh, so there's there are obvious um, um, shared palettes and shared uh, shapes and forms uh, going back and forth between them. Um, there's, um, this is a series of work uh, in the room as well that um, it's the first time they've all been shown together. So the preparatory drawing on the left is at U of Bell. The um, oil stick in the middle of uh, whirling night music is um, in a private collection. And then the painting on the right uh, is in the Canada Council Art Bank. Um, and uh, Mary's told me that this painting took her a year to do. Um, it has, um, again using a kind of pointillist technique that um, she started using very early on in the ceramics uh, but uh, fallen monument uh, obviously uh, it was an excellent example of uh, early use of pointillism in the um, in two-dimensional work um, this work uh, whirling night music um, when you look at the surface carefully, it almost looks as if the color is mixed on the surface, but it is not. These are all working in acrylic, uh, laying down again layers and layers of paint, uh, building up uh, over time. Uh, the um, optical effect uh, that's created is the, the sort of colors in between that mix um, uh, right on the, you know in our eye but right on the surface of the canvas um, the other thing that mary's talked about to me with this work is that 
whirling night music was um, done during a period of time where her health wasn't great um, and she was very focused on on this sort of one uh, set of work um, and particularly the painting so it was a very concentrated process and uh, it it really for her sort of was about uh, synergistic effects um, and of synesthesia. So when you start to and you, I think you can feel this in quite a bit of Mary's work, uh, early work in particular, uh, you can feel you know uh, motion uh, in the works, and you can you can almost hear color or you can see sound. So when your senses start to cross over and become um, less um, distinct and uh, more complicated. This is looking um, backwards towards the middle of the exhibition space. It's an installation shot. And this is the middle. So the, there's two galleries for the exhibition and this is sort of like the middle corridor. Um, chose to use this part of the exhibition space as um, uh, a transition space that would also loop back uh, to this idea of people uh, in the work. Um, there's a number of people that Mary returns to in her practice, in her work. Um, uh, John Will, her husband, an artist being, being one of them. Um, and um, these, these people provide shapes or they provide colors or they provide input of some sort that then Mary will use to um, create uh, a painting or the rules and parameters for a painting. Uh, so these are early examples of that and they're done on, they're actually done on litho plates. And um, uh, the John shape on the left hand side in the AFA collection, uh, he uh, chose that shape and Mary uh, with very small, uh, thousands, thousands, very small dashes uh, went around and reinforced that shape. Uh, there's a tension between the central figure, which becomes something that's very prominent in Mary's work from now on. So this is in the um, this is uh, early on in the the late 80s and the 90s. Uh, that central shape, uh, which you probably shouldn't do compositionally, uh, becomes uh, very prominent in the work. Uh, and then the tension between that central shape and the um, edge of the uh, picture plane. Uh, so in a sense, uh, playing a little bit like a, a Frank Stella, but with a thousand different dashes and no lines. Uh, the central figure um, where uh, on John's shape, it, that has been painted with the, the same colors and sanded back completely. And then uh, it's hard to see in this image, but the third, uh, the third uh, shape uh, is etched in and the, the uh, residue from the sanding has just been rubbed into the creases. You can see it a bit better there. Most of the pink areas in the show uh, indicate a, uh, uh, that there's a didactic uh, component to, uh, to that area. Uh, the two cabinets here uh, contain, um, first on the left, um, Mary's uh, test tiles that are in the University of Lethbridge uh, collection. And also the right side uh, are references or material objects, uh, things that Mary's collected over the years uh, that recur in the paintings either directly or, or um, are uh, sort of a reference that might not be visible. Mary's test tiles are incredibly important to, to her practice, her ceramic practice and process. Um, and you can see uh, by looking at them, the, the level of um, sort of care and precision to figure out exactly what um, a color and a pattern would do on a particular uh, clay body. 
Um, lots of lusters, airbrushing tested, pencils, all sorts of um, uh, different incursions into uh, ceramic uh, media. Um, we're going to go straight ahead here towards that triptych, which is uh, Mary's also done some very large works in the, the early to mid 90s, uh, many, of, many of which are not available. Um, uh, but uh, working on a larger scale to be able to kind of um, um, loosen up her, her process, move away from uh, feeling uh, too rigid within a process, um, using a different kind of mark making at a different scale, having a totally different uh, effect. Um, the colors in some of these works, the veiled works, uh, which are done with pastel are, are more muted uh, often. Um, and then the works on the right hand side here are what I would call the friend paintings and they were uh, devised by um, having um, cl having close friends um, uh, give her two uh, names of paints that they loved and two that they did not love and then those would become the um, sort of impetus for making other decisions about what paints would be used in and, and in what order around a central shape. The central shapes in these figures, and this one's for Myrna Harvey, a close friend of ours uh, that we lost this year, unfortunately. Uh, but this is Myrna Harvey's painting, and you can see that uh, the shape itself is something that Mary would uh, sketch out. Usually she said, well, she's watching TV, or they're not really that premeditated. They're a bit more than a doodle, but, um, um, uh, quite um, uh, automatic, if you will, uh, selected um, and uh, they're glass and they go over a painted surface. And then the, um, again, the sort of uh, frame uh, is reinforced over and over again by these uh, lines of color that are made up of uh, dashes. And just two shots of Mary's studio, first in the 1980s on the left and one from 2018 uh, on the right. Just to give you a sense so when you're working on these paintings and she has her system in place, how she reaches out to, to select the colors, in some cases knowing exactly which one she's going to use until it runs out and then, then having to substitute. And in other cases, uh, more arbitrarily, just picking them without without in fact knowing what she's going to get. This is the second room um, of the exhibition. Again, just an overall installation shot. Uh, looking backwards uh, towards the bunker, uh, some uh, found shape uh, pastels, uh, larger works. Um, and these found shape pastels, again, uh, 30 by 22, allowing Mary to uh, work in uh, layering layering up the pastel colors in straight dashes. Um, in this example, for uh, uh, in this example, there's straight dashes going one way, uh, usually working from top to bottom or bottom to top. Um, in some of the other examples, she may be working uh, from corner to corner, um, uh, and the lines might be wiggly, for example. And the form there is uh, obviously in the foreground. Um, Mary did a number of pieces starting in uh, 1995, working with very early Photoshop uh, techniques, uh, layers in Photoshop, where Mary really was kind of uh, fight with the system, if you will, uh, to make the layers uh, of Photoshop um, sort of do things they probably weren't designed to do. Um, and in most cases, these are the underlying digital grid structure uh, of, of um, the digital environment is uh, either blurred out or negated uh, to a de great degree in these works. From 1992 on, Mary, and even in some of the early ceramics work, Mary really did rely on the grid as a, a, a primary organizing principle. Um, and of course, it is a primary organizing principle for a lot of uh, uh, modernist work. 
but Mary's grids are always um, grids, but um, grids uh, that are uh, altered in a sense. So a grid is made up of lines. And if you look at Mary's work carefully as within this detail, you can see that those are lines and they do form a grid, but they are actually uh, more accurately long dashes of color that join up to give you the illusion or a semblance of a straight line. Um, and they have, and they have form. They are not, um, they are not flat. Uh, they are off the surface. So these digital prints, archival prints, um, Mary would uh, spend hours uh, generating on the computer by manipulating Photoshop layers. Uh, and then she would use those uh, to, uh, form the basis of a painting. Um, and there are a number of those works in the exhibition. This set of work, Intersection, uh, was uh, based actually on a, a close friend's diary, uh, Denise Clark, um, who uh, lost uh, her home in the flood um, in uh, 2008. Um, so these, um, these books, these pages, these very personal uh, subjective uh, memoirs uh, became the kind of fodder for Mary's um, um, project intersection, which originally started out as a movie that you see on the right hand side that was produced for a web-based project she did with um, Arlene Stamp, and uh, Vera Gartley uh, and myself in 2006. So each of the, um, the uh, images is a second from the movie. And the movie is produced in a very similar way of manipulating layers and layers and layers of information um, uh, on, on, in a digital environment and then um, animating that. And a couple of details of prints from intersection. And again, here the, you know, the digital uh, matrix that underline, underlies the technology that determines these works uh, is at every turn uh, sort of subverted or made to do things that it might not otherwise. There's also, it's interesting to me that there's um, a return here to some degree of representation in the work. Uh, so that you can clearly see the coil binding, the reference, the initial reference uh, that um, uh, started the project is clearly visible in some of the prints. Still look back. It's not great installation shot, but there is a group, group of six uh, uh, small paintings. So um, uh, 12 by 12 and eight by eight. Uh, these were works that were done after Mary had gone on a trip to India in 2002 uh, with Peter White and, and Giselle Amtea. This is a detail or uh, uh, one of the paintings, Mysore. And again, these paintings are done on um, plywood, half inch plywood. They are uh, clay coated um, and sanded very, very smoothly as she would have treated even the clay surfaces of her geometric forms um, or the uh, early um, fallen monument paintings. Sanded very smoothly and then applying um, a paint layer um, and sanding back. This is a insert, a glass insert, again uh, providing a, a space of, of uh, contemplation but also a space of, of um, resistance in the sense that it determines to some degree how the lozenges of paint uh, will um, um, uh, move around the picture plane. And the lozenges of paint, uh, the sort of decorative patterns of those um, drawn from uh, architectural features, brickwork, uh, clay brickwork uh, in particular, uh, that uh, Mary saw and documented uh, uh, on her travels uh, around India. 
Uh, these works are the colors um, are chosen based on the descriptions of the place in India uh, that they are named after that came out of uh, like a, you know, a Fodor's guidebook. Uh, so those sort of elements of chance are very much active in these works as well. And the lozenges are built up from sort of that outside to the inside. So if you see this work from, from a side view, you, you'll see an um, eighth of an inch to a quarter of an inch rise in some places as the paint accumulates. And you, what you're left with are these like shimmering edges uh, of the, the layers of paint below. Again, Mary often works in series. This, this is a combination of three different series of work um, to show um, some of the shifts and changes uh, of Mary's approach towards the grid from 2010 to 2013. Um, I'll just show one uh, Sandia grid, uh, which is watermelon in uh, Spanish. Sandia grid 2011 uh, on the left and uh, work on paper. And again, it's sort of very, um, very, very uh, thin uh, lines of paint drawn on a grid, hand drawn uh, with these shimmering edges that bleed out. Uh, to start with, uh, very, very much like a watercolor uh, on the lower layers. And then as they build up, um, you, the edges of the paint um, um, start to build a surface onto the paper. So Mary would take a, on a painting like this with Chaco Canyon, which is a newer work from 2020. And you'll notice these are all named after places, uh, many of which are uh, close to Mary's heart and uh, in Albuquerque, New Mexico, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And um, she would take a, a wider um, brush to lay down the initial grid lines and then slowly move to brushes that are narrower and narrower as she works up. Uh, so this red line that goes over the orange line beneath uh, is slightly uh, narrower and therefore you get that shimmering edge of the orange and then the yellow and the blue below, et cetera, et cetera. So they're built up uh, slowly, painstakingly. And finally, ACMA. Uh, ACMA uh, from 2020, uh, again, very special place, uh, a place that Mary has gone to uh, throughout her lifetime and returns to regularly. I was lucky enough to go there with her in 2018. Um, and I, one of the striking things for me during the project's process is that I uh, didn't, I understood the work from a conceptual uh, space. I understood it from a process-based space uh, and an art historical space, but I didn't really understand the work until I went to New Mexico with Mary uh, and started to see the, the importance of horizons and the importance of light, uh, the importance of, um, you know, the material aesthetics of the indigenous peoples uh, in those areas. Um, I didn't really understand how integral um, those experiences were to the understanding and interpretation of this work. So for me, um, people, places, and things also brings uh, me back very much to this idea of the subjective uh, within these abstract works, uh, within these uh, conceptual works that are rule-based, and the, the fact that aesthetics and subjectivity are still very much at the core of the, this work uh, and that this work has gone from almost full circle in a sense from the form uh, uh, and subject and object back to form and subject and object. So I think I'll leave it there. I'm pretty well at my time, I think. Thank you. Diana, that was spectacular. And um you know, on behalf of all of us here, thank you for, you know, an incredibly informative and generous um, presentation. Christine, if you're there, I know you wanted to say a few words. There she is. Hello. 
Hi. Um, first of all, Diana, that was brilliant. And thank you very much for um, your insights and, and tour into the exhibition. I would like uh, mainly to start by making sure I thank Diana Sherlock for bringing us this project in, in the first place and for doing an incredible amount of drawing together and interviews and research to have the insight that she just shared with all of you. Uh, thank you so much to Mary Shannon Will um, for everything in this exhibition and the chance to have it at the Nickel. Um, just thanks for everything, Mary, and the beauty, intelligence, and the heart that is within all of your work. I echo Diana's thanks to all of the lenders and the sponsors um, to the exhibition and the catalog. And then I'll just go very briefly to our real life aspirations um, for the chance for everyone to see the exhibition. Uh, there will be a wonderful catalog uh, produced. We are aiming for a timeline that will see it published by the end of January. A number of our visitors today are actually contributing in some way to the catalog. Um, but for real life visitations, because the Nickel is located within a university campus and of course prioritizing access to students, staff and faculty, we are a little behind other institutions in public access. And the current restrictions of the last week or so contracting access again has interrupted us a bit. As soon as we have the way clear available and we are working on it, it will be posted on our Facebook and on our website. And the plan is to allow community access on Saturday afternoons. It will be a free but ticketed system. Whereas other institutions are doing, you will book a time to come and view the exhibition to ensure social distancing, safety, and access for all. The exhibition itself will be up through to, currently through to the end of April, depending on what happens in this crazy world. Um, we are already looking at the potential of expanding that if necessary to ensure public access. Hope that answers some questions straight away and we'll try and keep you posted. Questions for, uh, I'll turn it back to Michelle in case there are questions for Diana. Thank you, Christine. Um, Diana, if you're all right, we can, we can continue for a few minutes if anybody has a question. Just unmute yourself and uh, don't be shy. Or if you wanna leave something in the chat, I'm also monitoring the chat. Uh, would I be able to ask a question? Absolutely. Um, so, Diana, I was wondering, um, I was really noticing like about uh, the cumulative process and like the meticulous nature of Mary's work. Um, and I'm like a young maker and my work is also very process based. And so I wondered um, how Mary feels about time in relation to her work and if time is ever a part of the rules that she creates or if it's something that she leaves out? Um, well, Mary would be the best one to ask that question to. Uh, and she's listening, so maybe she'll pipe in as well. Uh, but we, ha we have talked about time a little bit, for sure. Um, I mean, obviously the work is very labor intensive, um, takes a lot of time. Um, some of my observations around it would be that the um, you know, the processes themselves, whether it's ceramics uh, uh, or any of the other materials that Mary's using, um, they dictate the time it takes to make the particular work to a great degree. So if you look at a ceramics process, um, you know, as Mary says, you, you know, it, it's very, it's a very organized process. It's very technical. You have to do things in, in the right order at the right time, um, you know, or you, or you don't get the right object. You don't get the right effect, right? And the right surface. Um, and I think you could probably say that about her her paintings as well. Um, there's a certain amount of time that is um, predetermined, like she has to wait for layers of paint to dry 
before she can go back in to lay another layer down. Um, otherwise, the color won't be as pure. Um, so, so those things, I think, more than anything, are dictated by the materials themselves. And then Mary responds to that. Um, certain, she, I know she's been asked a number of times, uh, and I think I've asked her as well, like, how do you know it's done? You know, so, so like some of that work could go on forever, right? Like, how's it done? When's it done? And I think there's a, it's an intuitive response to a degree uh, that it's done when you think it's done, but it's also sometimes done when the, the rule runs out uh, or has been satisfied. And sometimes it's done when the material tells you it is done. So that, that's the way I would approach those, those ideas of time and the work. Yeah, thank you. That's a really, really good answer. <laughs> Thanks for the question. Other questions? Diana, I'm going to... I have a question. If Please, she's... go ahead. Hi, this is Larissa. Hi, um, Larissa. Hi. I was wondering if Mary's listening, because it would be a question also for her, because I also have a really labor intensive practice. Um, and there are moments when it's actually physically painful or uh, uh, mentally painful because you've set up a something and you, you need to follow it through. Yeah. And I was actually wondering if Mary finds these things also um, um, heavy or painful or boring or uh, and then you come out of it and go into I'm wondering about her process. Thank you. Yeah, I, um, I, I'll wait and see if Mary responds, but I can respond to that just based on conversations I've had with her. Um, I know the shift from ceramics to 2D was partly about that, uh, about labor, about the physicality. Um, I've heard that many times from ceramics as, as well. Um, I know that the whirling night music uh, painting and that that's that triptych that series it's not a triptych but that series um, took over a year because she was already in ill health but then the painting too was um, sort of uh, exacerbated it right um, and I know that now recently with her health um, you know, it's interesting if you think about the last slides I showed you, every, pretty much everything I had showed you has been a grid, it has been based on a grid, some modification of a grid, um, these lodge and shapes. And then all of a sudden there's a handful of works in the show, including this one that are, are lines, they're straight lines. And that has to do with Mary being able to comfortably support her arm when she's painting. Um, so that's also a physical uh, a way something physical has manifested itself in the work. Um, and then I do have a comment here for you, Larissa, for you from Mary. She said, I almost went blind with the early work. So I think, you know, it's obviously that the the work has you know is physical uh physically taxing uh as it is intellectually taxing yeah thanks for that other questions i'll just remind people that the um the talk will be posted to youtube um and i'll make sure that the uh, the link is circulated so uh, i hope that other students or, um, you know, I'm thinking a lot of members of the Alberta Craft Council would be very interested in, in, uh, in this talk and uh, certainly encourage you to share it with your friends. And, um, and I would, I just have one more um, note here from, from Mary, uh, again, for Larissa's question, that her marks got increasingly bigger you know, and I was saying they got looser. Well, yeah, they were looser and they were bigger. And that was partly because of, um, you know, her vision. So she could see them better. Um, so there's that. And before we go, I also wanted to pass along from Mary that um, she just wants to thank everyone so much. Everyone at the Nickel, all the staff, Nickel at noon, uh, and everybody who came today 
to listen to the talk and to support the project and she's just ever so grateful and um, so I'm just I'll pass that on to you uh, on her behalf so thank you oh uh, well with that with that final note thank you Diana thank you Mary thank you all of you for joining us today um, I think this has been a, a really terrific presentation and um, we will call it call it a day here but I hope to see you all next time uh, for another presentation same time same channel and uh, again watch for that YouTube link getting posted um, you can you can relive Diana and uh, we're really looking forward to being able to invite people back into this space and um, the images are beautiful Diana but you have to say it yeah Not like the same. <laughs> you know it's it's like this kind of trying to show this kind of work on a on a powerpoint pre presentation mediated by zoom just seems like egregious to me but it's the best we got right now so that's yeah. that's all we have but um please please go see the show because this absolutely cannot do justice to any of the work yeah agreed yeah great thank you so much and uh hope to see you again thank you diana thank you Bye, everybody.